In this lecture, we'll talk about the water molecule, its structure, properties, forms, and roles in food. Hopefully, you'll learn how can a simple water molecule greatly affect the food. First off, let's have a bit of a review of your chemistry class about the structure of the water molecule. So as its chemical formula denotes, a water molecule contains one atom of oxygen and two atoms of hydrogen. As you can see in the figure, the oxygen has six electrons as represented by the yellow dots. One, two, three, four, five, and six. While each hydrogen has one electron as represented by the yellow plus sign. Normally, the oxygen here wants to have eight electrons. That is why one pair of its electrons is shared with the hydrogen. Meanwhile, since each hydrogen intends to have two electrons, both hydrogen atoms pair with the electrons from oxygen. Consequently, this sharing of electrons creates a bond between oxygen and hydrogen known as the covalent bond. Okay, so this one here is a covalent bond. This one too. Another one is here, and this one too is a covalent bond, and so on. So in the figure, you have there three water molecules, and it is noticeable that water mo molecule has a seemingly bent or a boomerang-like structure. Now, what's the story behind that? So here is a very clear and nice picture showing that water molecule is not a linear molecule. Instead, it has a roughly tetrahedron orientation having oxygen at the center and at the corners are two hydrogen atoms and two lone pair electrons. The thing here is that these lone pairs seem to be jealous because they don't have partners. That's why they tend to push the bonded electrons away, resulting in a boomerang-like water structure. Now let's talk about the hydrogen bonding of water. First, let's discuss a little bit about the covalent bond. Again, covalent bond is formed in a molecule when atoms are joined together through the sharing of electrons. However, in the process of sharing, the electrons are not shared equally within the molecule. For instance, in a water molecule, when oxygen shares with hydrogen, the oxygen hogs or draws the electrons to itself. Because oxygen has all these extra electrons, it has a partially negative charge. On the other hand, hydrogen here is getting the electrons hugged or drawn away from it. That is why it has a partially positive charge. So technically, a water molecule is polar as it contains partial positive charge on the hydrogen atoms and partial negative charge on oxygen. Now, when the partially positive hydrogen in one water molecule interacts with the partially negative oxygen of the other water molecule, a weak bond is formed. And that weak bond is what we call as hydrogen bond. And this attraction is sort of like magnets. So you see, as long as between molecules, the oxygen is hugging or drawing electrons from hydrogen, hydrogen bonds are formed. Aside from oxygen and hydrogen interaction, hydrogen bonds are formed as well upon interaction of hydrogen with fluorine and nitrogen. So let me just clarify a thing here. Covalent bonds are formed within a molecule, but hydrogen bonds are formed between molecules. Okay. So let's take a look at the hydrogen bonds formation in water and in ice. Unlike the hydrogen bonds in liquid water, as you can see in the figure, 
hydrogen bonds in ice are stable and more ordered forming a hexagonal shape with a hole in the middle making ice less dense. That is why ice floats in water. So now, how exactly do water molecules affect the food material? The answer can be attributed to the hydrogen bonds. Although hydrogen bond is a weak bond, but it usually occurs in large numbers, contributing therefore to a remarkable effect on the properties of the substance in which it is found. For instance, a single water molecule can participate in a maximum of four hydrogen bonds because it can accept two bonds using the lone pairs in oxygen and donate two hydrogen atoms. Let's try to locate the four hydrogen bonds in this particular water molecule. Okay, so one bond can be found here. Another one is here, here as well, and another one is here. For you to have a clear picture as to the occurrence of large number of hydrogen bonds, let's take a look at this. Again, remember that one water molecule is equivalent to four hydrogen bonds. Now, how many water molecules do you think are there in that particular waterfall? How about the hydrogen bonds? How about in a drop of water? How many water molecules and hydrogen bonds are there? So first, let's compute how many molecules of water are there in one drop. Here's the solution. Basically, one drop of water is equivalent to 0.0018 ml, and the density of water is 1 gram per ml. Knowing the, the volume and the density of water, we can compute for the mass. So you have there 1 gram per ml times 0.0018 ml, you get there 0.0018 gram. The molar mass of water is 18 grams per mole. So, the number of moles in 0.0018 gram of water is given mass divided by the molar mass. You have there 0.0001 mole. And knowing the Avogadro's number, which is 6.022 times 10 to the power of 23 molecules in one mole, we can compute with the number of molecules of water in a drop. So we'll just use the ratio and proportion. If one mole of water is equivalent to 6.022 times 10 to the power of 23 molecules, how many molecules of water are there in 0 0.0001 mole? So you do the math and the result is 6.022 times 10 to the power of 19 molecules. Imagine the amount of hydrogen bonds. You see, hydrogen bonds occur in large number. That's why Great is their effect to the properties of the substance it is found. Most of the unique properties of water are basically attributed to the hydrogen bonds. And on that note, let's now discuss some properties of water. There are so many properties of water, but in this particular lecture, we'll only cover the specific heat, the latent heat, vapor pressure, boiling point, and solution. So, specific heat is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a kilogram of a particular material by 1 degree Celsius. While, for the latent heat of water, it can be latent heat of fusion or latent heat of vaporization. Latent heat of fusion is the amount of energy required to convert 1 gram of ice to water without temperature changes, 
while the latent heat of vaporization is the energy required to convert one gram of water into vapor. Again, when we speak of specific heat, it involves raising the temperature. While when we speak of latent heat of fusion, it involves converting ice to water. And for the latent heat of vaporization, it involves converting water into vapor. Basically, the specific heat of water is 1 calorie per gram per degree Celsius. It means that if you want to raise the temperature of water from 0 to 100 degrees Celsius, it takes 100 calories to raise the temperature of 1 gram of water. What's the implication if the latent heat of fusion is 6.01 kilojoules per mole? It means that 1 gram of ice at the freezing point absorbs approximately 6.01 kilojoules per mole as it is converted into its liquid form. On the other hand, if the latent heat of vaporization is 40.65 kilojoules per mole, it means that 1 gram of, ice of water at the boiling point absorbs approximately 40.65 kilojoules per mole as it becomes steam. So you see, both the specific heat and latent heat for water are significantly high. In order to heat water, a significant amount of energy is needed. And it's very essential to note that, particularly when using water as a medium of heat transfer. Next, we have vapor pressure and boiling point. If a spilled water from a glass is left and wiped on the table, over time, it will dry up because liquid evaporates. How does it happen? Well, the individual molecule of water gain enough energy to escape as vapor. And as that gaseous vapor molecules exert pressure on the surface of the liquid, that is what we call as vapor pressure. Meanwhile, the boiling point is defined as the temperature by which the vapor pressure of the liquid is in equilibrium with the pressure applied to the liquid. Now, here are some questions. Why does it take shorter cooking time if pressure, pressure cooker is used? Well, when pressure cooker is used, the external pressure is increased with the presence of trapped steam inside the pressure cooker upon heating. Thus, the boiling point increases leading to a shorter cooking time of a particular food. The advantage of shorter cooking time is that the essential nutrients will not be lost as fast and also liquid is not lost such that at the end of the operation, food doesn't appear dry at all. Next question, why does it take longer to cook an egg in the mountains than at sea level? Well, at high altitudes, the external pressure is decreased. Therefore, less energy is needed for the water molecules to bounce upwards to escape into the atmosphere. With that, water boils at a lower temperature, and thus, longer time is needed to cook the egg. Okay, so now let's discuss about solution. Solution could either be ionic or molecular. When substances that ionize in water, like salts, acids, or bases, are dissolved, an ionic solution is formed. On the other hand, when polar molecules, such as sugar, which are associated with hydrogen bonding, are dissolved, molecular solutions are formed. Let's dig in as to how ionic and molecular solutions are formed. Let's say we placed sodium chloride in water. Eventually, the water molecules will reduce the attractive forces between the Na and Cl ions, breaking the ionic bonds. The individual ions will then become hydrated and there it goes your ionic solution. How about when we place sugar in water? Well, with sugar as a polar molecule, 
hydrogen bond interchange takes place such that the hydrogen bonds on the sugar molecules are broken and replaced by hydrogen bonds between water and the sugar molecules. Thereby, each sugar molecule will be surrounded with water molecules, causing gradual hydration of the sugar crystal. The question is, why is sucrose more solub soluble in, water, in hot water than in cold water? Basically, the application of heat disrupts the hydrogen bonds and simultaneously reduces water water and sucrose sucrose attraction, leading to faster hydration of sucrose molecules. So now let's discuss about the forms of water. We have here free, adsorbed, and bound water. Free water is the water that can be squeezed out of a particular food. For instance, free water is the water extracted easily in fruits. Or if you have seen a water separation in yogurt, that water is actually a free water. Adsorbed water, on the other hand, is not readily extracted out of the food. For example, the water attached to the surface of polysaccharides and proteins. Another example is the water involved in rehydration of starch. While for the bound water, it is the water that cannot be easily extracted too. It's physically trapped within crystals such that in crystalline starch. For free and adsorbed water, they can support microbial growth while the bound water cannot since it's physically trapped within crystals. Lastly, let's have a brief overview as to the role of water in food. In many fresh foods, water is the most abundant component. Containing that much amount of water has good impacts on some aspects. However, the bad thing is, water makes the food conducive to microbial growth. That's the reason why fresh foods and produce are generally prone to microbial contamination and spoilage. Well, in terms of texture, foods with low moisture content about 10 to 20 percent or less tend to be rigid and hard while foods with about 35 percent or more tend to be flexible and soft in the case of gluten formation water of course is needed when we talk about gluten it's a protein that acts like a binder that holds food together and adds stretchy texture without water the key proteins that form gluten in dry wheat flour are rigid and inflexible at room temperature.